Hello, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, we'll give it a, a minute or two before we launch into today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Hello, I think we're going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Um, thank you all for joining us. My name is Liesl Hans. I'm the Director of Programs here with the Alliance for Water Efficiency. And our topic today is the Water Loss Module, which is part of our water conservation tracking tool. I will first give a shout out to our wonderful sponsor, uh, for today's webinar. So Kavanaugh sponsored today's webinar and they are um, very well steeped in the water loss world. Um, and they really work on um, two areas. They work as on optimizing water efficiency and water loss. They also have another um, section of their work that works on waste to energy. Um, but Kavanaugh has provided uh, water loss training and technical assistance to many utilities. Um, helps validate water audits, provides advanced analytics, um, they conduct gap analysis and create business cases for action. Um, so we just want to say thank you for supporting utilities and addressing water loss. Thank you for being an AWP member and for sponsoring this webinar. The webinar is 60 minutes today and we'll set aside some time at the end for some questions. Um, audio is uh, through your telephone or your computer, whichever option you've selected. We do have it in mute mode since we are recording this so that folks in the future can um, rewatch or watch if they couldn't join us today. Um, you can type in questions and Brad will be monitoring um, any questions that come in and we'll make sure that those are addressed or if we need to follow up on those, we can um, send separate emails. And I will mention that exactly a year ago today, there was um, a webinar that was on the tracking tool as a whole. So if you're interested in going back in time and looking at the, the bigger context of what the tracking tool is, um, you can go back and check it out. So if you go into the Alliance for Water Efficiency's website and the webinar history, you'll find the water conservation tracking tool webinar, which was last year on October 27th, but 2021. And David Mitchell and Chris Williams, who were our consultants in helping develop these tools, spoke. And so if you want more of a deep dive, that's a 90 minute webinar, so it's a big one, but just wanted to put that out there that that's another resource for you all in using these tools. And in case you're unfamiliar, uh, Alliance for Water Efficiency, we are um, basically your, your membership organization. We're here to promote efficient and sustainable water use. We do that through a variety of ways. Um, we're a great and very unique network for collaboration and um, policy advocacy and largely information sharing and creating resources and education and information to help um, everyone that works in water conservation and water efficiency to do their jobs better. 
And so if you're not a member already and you're interested, please reach out um, and get connected to this great group. We have, um, you know, for example, some new tools that are coming out, but we also have reports and information on things like irrigation restrictions, sustainable landscapes, um, things even like high efficiency toilet saturation studies, um, affordability projects, uh, report on connection fees, and soon to come, I'll talk a little bit about at the end, um, a project related to AMI and leak notifications and um, our suite of cooling technology tools and resources. So water loss. Why are we talking about water loss? Why did we build in a water loss module into the conservation tracking tool? Um, from sort of a public perspective, water loss can be a really highly visible and disruptive issue. And so while we know water loss might be occurring all over your system in different ways, uh, your customers really do remember the breaks that shut down intersections, the ones that cause the boil orders or cause damage, the ones that impact their commute or affect their business. So if you are in the business of saving water, then you should be in the business of caring about reducing water loss. Our focus is really on the water loss that happens before the meter. That's the purpose of today's webinar. This is different than maybe leak notification programs or high bill alerts, things like that, that try to address water use and possible leaks and abnormal use on the customer side of the meter. So this is looking at how to prevent or reduce water loss before it gets to the meter. And this is largely um, based on what is a very common tool that's used um, across the US and Canada, which um, AWWA offers a free water audit software. They have the most latest version is version six, um, although some other states and utilities still use version four or version five. This is the website where you can find it and there's the corresponding M36 water loss manual and water audits. So these are the, the resources if you're interested in digging more. Um, the water um, audit software is there for you. You can download it um, and check it out. This is a visual. This is um, available on our website, but there's lots of different versions of this, different colors and things like that across the website. But this is basically kind of looking at the, the water balance in a, in a water utility system. So just to give context of what we're going to be focusing on today. So this water audit methodology was developed jointly by the International Water Association and the American Water Works Association in 2000, and it's described in detail on those other resources that I just previously brought up. And it basically shows the various components in which the water volumes can be tracked. So you kind of read it from left to right of where you start with the water, bring it into the system, and then where it goes. So first I'll point out this one over here that we talk about a lot in water loss is non-revenue water. And it's just what it sounds like. It's water that's treated and supplied and distributed, but it doesn't actually generate revenue for the utility. It's kind of like buying food at a grocery store and you just eventually throwing it away without actually eating it. So non-revenue water, first term to notice for today. So why would we focus on non-revenue water? Non-revenue water is this water that is treated and supplied that, again, does not generate revenue for the utility. And reducing this volume is an opportunity to reduce costs. Like any other means to achieve water efficiency and conservation, addressing non-revenue water can be a cost-effective and a cheaper alternative to a supply expansion or a treatment plan expansion or other infrastructure projects. You don't want to have to ramp up treatment or infrastructure to overcome the losses just to get enough water to your customers. And managing non-revenue water is a great way to reduce energy use and therefore reduce greenhouse gases, which of course are driving climate change. And addressing non-revenue water is of course a great way to build trust with your customers. And it shows that you are also working to reduce waste. So this is especially important in a time where you're asking your customers um, to reduce because of a shortage or a drought, or if you're encouraging them to be more efficient, or if you're encouraging them to track down leaks and address water loss it's really important that you also show that you're doing that on the utility side, which of course translates to benefits for them because you're managing costs better. So water losses, um, I'll just point out that in terms of non-revenue water, today we're not really gonna be talking about the unbilled unauthorized um, consumption. So um, 
this is just consumption that is being consumed but is not being uh, metered or unbilled. So we're not talking about that today. We're going to focus down a section into the section called water losses. And the year, I'm going to point out that there are two categories here. One is called apparent losses and one is called real losses. So apparent losses are not real losses in the sense of real wet water leaking out of pipes, but it's more so inaccuracies that cause the utility to under collect revenue. And this might distort consumption data, which of course affects demand projections or the ability to estimate the impact of water conservation programs and more. So while this is still important to figure out, I will note that this module does not focus on that portion of the non-revenue water. So really we're focusing on the real losses. So that um, section down below. So the real wet water leaking out of things. So there are different types of leaks that might go into the real losses. So the terminology in the biz is real loss component analysis, which really just means breaking down real losses into different sources <coughs> of water loss and identifying different options for reducing those real losses. So here are three common um, ways that those are broken down. First is background leakage, and this is the leakage that's happening throughout your system that is um, small enough or presenting in such a way that it is not detectable using sort of traditional acoustic equipment that a proactive leak detection crew might use. The second one is unreported leakage. So this is the leakage that is occurring but is detectable by traditional acoustic equipment, but perhaps um, is not surfacing. Um, and so the public or your utility crew aren't seeing it at the, the surface level or in other ways. And then the last one is the reported leakage. And this is the one that you know, people see out in the world, um, might be really, really visible in those big main breaks that shut down intersections and streets, um, or it might be smaller than that. But these are the ones that are reported um, by public or utility staff. And hidden losses is this kind of fourth category that is in the same bucket as unreported leakage, but are the losses that aren't ad, um, identified by a proactive leak notification or a leak um, detection system. And so there are different strategies to address each type of leak or each source of uh, real water losses. And you'll see that some of the strategies are consistent across each of these, um, and there are different ones for some of the other ones. So pressure reduction across the board is one strategy, um, and main and surface replacement is a strategy that works across the board. Uh, and then in terms of background and unreported, talking about reducing the number of joints and fittings, obviously when there are less connection points, there are less ways for water to leak. And then you'll see a couple more highlighted here, whereas the proactive leak detection program and then optimizing the repair time. So when something is reported, um, repairing or replacing or just addressing that situation faster. Utility water loss and asset management has really evolved over time. And it is um, in some cases still very much sort of a reactive find and fix as you go. Um, but many utilities are moving more and more toward advanced asset management and predict and prevent strategies. And so some of these strategies that are highlighted here are your utility are going is going to be doing. So for example, of course, you're going to be working on distribution system repair and replacement. Um, and there are great technology and solutions out there that give a lot greater flexibility and more um, a bigger range of options than just having to replace everything. So there's lots of options that involve just repairing pipes. Um, but for the purposes of specifically trying to reduce water loss, Replacing pipes is not really a cost-effective strategy. It, of course, helps, um, but I just want to sort of point out that when we get into the water loss module, we're not going to be talking about strategies like um, main and service line and lateral line replacements. Um, it will um, certainly help, but we're going to be focusing on the three that are highlighted, which are often the more cost-effective ones for specifically targeting um, reducing real water losses in your system. And these are the three that are modeled in the water conservation tracking tool. So what is the tracking tool? The tracking tool is an Excel-based model, um, and this is a, a great tool that goes far beyond the water loss module that we're going to be talking about today. 
but you can track conservation programs over time. You can create scenarios moving forward and explore what different portfolios of conservation activities might look like and how they might um, benefit your utility and how they might shake out in terms of a cost benefit analysis. Um, you can save these scenarios and compare them over time and ultimately help you plan for the future as well as document what you've done in the past. There are data visualizations and various tables and things like that and data that you can um, take and make your own if you want to for plans and presentations. This is a free resource for AWE members. We came out with version four last fall. Um, there was just a minor pivot table glitch. So we have actually a version 4.1 that's available as of May of this year. So if you're interested, follow that link and we can get you a copy of that. So the specific tracking tool water loss module is tab seven. All the tabs um, for the inputs are numbered and the water loss one is tab seven. And this estimates how future water loss may be reduced through proactive leak detection, pressure management, and or accelerated repair of reported leaks. So the ones that the public is finding or utility staff are finding that are surfacing. And you can compare different water loss management scenarios. So you can play around with all three of those, do one, do all, do different levels of them. And then you can also look at the sensitivity for some of the parameters and the assumptions um, to do a more robust scenario analysis. And again, I'll highlight that these are strategies to reduce real water losses, not those apparent losses. So not to say that those aren't important, but this is not modeling that. And I will highlight that this uh, tool and this resource can be used as a platform to discuss your water loss audit results. Um, it can be used to uh, explore with all of the different um, staff that are often involved in a water loss audit. Um, and help bring people together and bring together consistent information so that you can just discuss different strategies, what they cost, how you might move forward in improving your water loss challenges. And before we jump in too much further, I will put out a hit plug that this is um, a model that is a function of the data that you put into it. Um, so it is not a super detailed analysis. There are some assumptions that have gone into this, but beyond that, if you put um, bad data in, you're going to get bad results out. So this is a, a garbage in, garbage out situation. Um, so as you have better data, use better data, um, but you can also explore different scenarios using different, um, different estimates of things. But I just want to point out that this will not solve, if you have a problem with bad data, this model will not solve that problem for you. So the tracking tool is has many different tabs and many different sources of data that um, go into it and different things that come out of it. So what do you need to enter to actually use the water loss module, the, the tab seven? So there's a couple things that you do need to enter at a minimum in order to get results out of the water loss module tool. So first is on tab one, there's a whole set of information that we ask you about service area data. And the main thing that's coming out of that is the active service connections. So water loss is often thought about in terms of loss per connections per day or loss per connection. Um, and the way that we think about scaling it is often thought about in terms of scaling based on um, information about your distribution system, which includes service connections. The other piece, and this, there will be a little red, I screenshot it there for you, a little red reminder to enter the avoided cost worksheet before using the water loss module calculator. And you can do this. So if you enter in the avoided cost tab, you can get estimates in the water loss section that are the economic estimates. So if you want to do some cost benefit analysis, um, if you want to look at what the net present value is, you do need to have those avoided costs entered. Otherwise, you're only going to generate the costs of a water loss management program and you're not going to see what the benefits are to your utility as a whole. So of course you'll get a horrible benefit cost ratio. So if you don't wanna look at that component, you don't have to enter those um, pieces. However, in order to do the actual water loss pieces, you do need that first part, which incorporates the active service connections. So in tab one, you'll see a section that is called service connections. And um, 
the way the tracking tool works is that you enter a base year as well as sort of a future planning horizon. Um, and so you'll have different touch points and you can enter in as much or as little of these data, but there are a few that are required. And you'll see that um, the number of service connections totals at the bottom and that translates into tab two, which is called base year demands. And one section of tab two asks about non-revenue water specifically. And you'll see the total connections from your base year is brought over into these calculations. Um, tab two, the way that you can think about this data is your base year. So you'll wanna use maybe your most recent water loss audit. So you'll want to enter that information from your most recent one or ideally corresponding to the base year. Um, and non-revenue water, the way that this translate in the tracking tool is a translate into your baseline water demand. Because obviously the water that you're generating in your utility is the build water that your customers are using, but it is also this non-revenue water. And you'll see the different categories here that correspond to that um, big water balance box chart, um, which incorporates the unbilled authorized, the apparent losses, and the real losses, which is what we're focusing on today. And then tab three is that avoided cost tab. Um, we're not going to go through all of this, but this is where you would enter in the relevant information for utility that can help translate into the benefit cost analysis. So this is where the benefits basically get generated from, that if you're reducing water demand through water conservation or efficiency or through water loss management, um, you can avoid certain costs. So these are all going to be very specific to a given utility. Um, and if you want more information or help with that, reach out. We can offer technical assistance for support with um, this tool for all of our members. So please reach out if you have questions or want some additional support in working through um, this tool and making it more useful for your organization. But this is the tab that you need information for to do the economic estimates, which include the um, benefit cost ratio, as well as the net present value. So where is this all going? If you do the water loss tab, the way that it can translate, you can just work within the module too, and I'll show you what that looks like here in a moment. But if you're really using the tracking tool as a whole, the way it translates is into these demand projections, um, as well as looking at different strategies. So the baseline demand is going to incorporate um, those base level of water losses scaled up over time as your connections grow. And then the yellow line down here is going to incorporate any conservation programs and any water loss management strategies. And so you can see what the difference is over time that if you implement certain scenarios, what the impact will be to your demands. And within the demand projections, everything that's in the graph format is also in a table format. And so you can edit any of those if you have better information um, or if the model isn't quite um, projecting forward like you might expect it to or like you are doing within your own organization. So you can edit the forecasts that go into that blue baseline demand projection, and you can also turn on and off those adjustments, which one of those adjustments is this real water loss management. So these are all things that you can play with and different ways that you can compare different scenarios. And again, I'll do one more plug for what the big picture looks like, how water loss translates into the demand projections for the tracking tool. If you only enter information on that base year demand, so that you know initial information that goes into tab one and tab two, basically you'll just see water loss incorporated into the blue baseline projections. If you also include information in the water loss module, but just the information about um, box two, which I'll show you what that incorporates, but it's just a little bit more specific information around real losses, then that's what will translate into um, your demand projections. And if you also incorporate information about water loss management strategies, then that will get incorporated into that yellow line as one of the potential ways that you are addressing um, water use in your system. So just big picture so you know how it moves forward throughout the tool. So as a reminder, these are the three different types of leaks that we're going to be talking about in the water loss module. And then here are the strategies and the three highlighted ones, pressure reduction, op optimized repair time, and proactive leak detection are the three strategies that are modeled in the water loss module tool. 
So I'm gonna walk through this through slides and then as time allow, I will bring up the actual Excel-based tool so you can see what that looks like um, live. But I wanted to make sure that you all have these resources on slides um, and it's a little bit easier to talk through some of the tips. So when you get into the water loss module tab, which is tab seven again, there are different boxes. Uh, the first box is looking to get information about your distribution system. So in the tool in general, the blue boxes are where your, our user inputs, and then the white boxes are the tool is generating that input. So it's either bringing information in from another place in the tracking tool, or it's calculating something for you. So in this case, for example, here, you'll see active service connections, and that's brought over from a previous tab in the tool. And here is where you're gonna enter in um, information like your miles of mains, average age. Again, this is not um, breaking down into different um, buckets, but this is looking at things kind of at an average level. Average operating pressure. We know for some that average is very much uh, a loose average and they have very different and distinct pressure zones. So um, I just want to point out that that's um, um, just an average. And then You'll also want to enter inactive service connections. So for the rest of the tool, it's really looking at um, your active demand, your active connections and what your customers are doing and how your um, conservation programs might affect those demands. This wants to incorporate inactive service connections. because Inactive service connections, of course, represent additional distribution system infrastructure that can um, contribute to water losses. So if these are pressurized service connections, you want to incorporate them. Uh, for the average length of service lateral past the curb stop, if you have meters that are largely located at the curb stop, you'll just want to enter a zero. If they're located other places, perhaps um, in, inside people's basements or a ways into their front yard, for example, you'll want to enter in an average length there. And then the infrastructure condition factor, uh, I will point out that there are a couple parameters in this tool that can make a big difference in the results that you get. This is one of them, this ICF value. So I would suggest that as you go through your scenarios, playing around with this number um, so that you can see how much it changes the results that you get. Um, so if you have an ICF equal to one, that's basically saying that you're operating at the technical minimum background losses. Um, so there is uh, a lot of difference of opinions of what this value should be. Um, and ultimately no one really knows how system background losses change over time because they're background losses and we don't necessarily know where they are, or how much they are. And so for the purposes of the tool, the decision by our um, great consultant partners was just to leave that flat over time, just so you know that, that how that factors. So we've used a, a 1.2 here, um, but when I bring up the tool, you can, and as you play around with it, you'll see how much that factor can vary. So if your organization has done water loss auditing um, consistently over time and maybe has a more advanced asset management program, they might have a better sense of what this number is. Um, otherwise, I would suggest just doing a sensitivity analysis and using a couple different values so that you can get a range of results um, and use that in your conversations with your organization. The second box is information about real water loss um, inputs. And so there's just a couple numbers that you have to add in here and then the rest are calculated for you. Again, this highlights why you need to input the number of connections, um, which is brought in the active service connections, and then you add in the inactive service connections so that it can calculate this gallons per connections per day in the right column of this box. The first one that you add is basically the rate of rise, which is the rate of rise of leakage. So it's the assumption that new unreported leaks are occurring in the system and they are likely to, to increase over time. And so you can potentially use audit history if you um, can look at the trends over time from a reliable audit history. Um, again, the sort of a garbage in, garbage out situation. Here we use 0.75, other systems provide different guidance. Um, this is one where there is a lot of sensitivity to the results. So this is the other parameter that I would suggest doing sensitivity analysis around. So playing with the value of this, 
and you'll see how it translates into the projections for water losses, as well as the impact of um, potential management programs. Um, so you'll enter in reported leakage, um, which is from, you know, actually ones that are reported and fixed out there in the world. These are the ones that surface. So your um, service repair history can help provide information about that. Unreported leakage, this is from your proactive leak detection program. So if you don't have a proactive leak detection program where you've got crews going out with acoustic um, or other types of equipment and trying to find leaks proactively before they surface. Um, so if you don't have that program, you'll put a zero in there. But if you do have a program, you can incorporate information from um, those service logs and bring that into this. And then the rest of the boxes are calculated for you. So background losses um, is based on the distribution infrastructure information, and then hidden losses are basically calculated as what's left over. And then you end up with your total real losses. And so if you only go this far in the water loss module, then this will translate into your demand projections. However, you can take it a step further and look at how different strategies can impact your um, projected water loss and what they cost. So the first option is looking at a proactive leak detection program. So you might already have one of these in place at your organization. And this is all inputs that then get translated into some of the outputs. So survey rate, in this context, it's incorporated in terms of miles per month. So if you know what the number is on an annual basis, just divide that number by 12 and put that into here. And then cost of leak detection per mile, um, your utility should have numbers on this if you have a pro, uh, program in place. So this would incorporate um, costs related to staff and equipment. Um, you can use a range kind of 200 to 1,000 um, dollars per mile. We, um, in this example, we have 750. Um, it can range quite a bit depending on where you are and what goes into your um, detection program. And then the next one is the estimated proportion of service leaks. And this is really asking um, the percentage of leaks that are on service um, lines versus main lines. Um, and you can use repair logs to come up with a, an estimate of what that looks like. And then it asks for some averages of flow rates. So again, this is a great opportunity to work with folks who work on your water loss audit, if that includes you, um, and work with folks like your meter shop or your um, distribution crews um, to get some information like this. And I will just point out that typically the flow rates for the unreported leaks are likely to be lower than flow rates for reported leaks. Um, it's, it's not exact, but largely the, the ones that surface are of course gonna be the higher flow rates. And then you'll incorporate average cost to repair those. So average cost to repair um, unreported, a main leak and an unreported service leak. So those proactive detection crews as they find a leak on a main, which is a, a larger pipe, um, likely to have more costs associated with it, might be in a, a busier street, which requires a different additional cost to manage uh, versus um, a smaller leak. The second strategy that you can incorporate is pressure reduction. Um, this is important overall as high pressure can put strain on a distribution system. Um, although I will point out that fluctuating pressure can put even more stress on the system. But for the purposes of this tool, we just wanted to at a minimum incorporate this strategy and incorporate the notion that um, in some cases, really high pressure in a distribution system can be impacting water loss and um, causing that to be higher than necessary. So there are cases where reducing the pressure can um, have some benefits in terms of reducing water loss. So you'll want to incorporate um, how much a potential that you could reduce the pressure as well as what it would cost um, to do that. And the tool I'll point out treats this as a one-time cost. So a one-time um, expense that your organization is incurring for those economic calculations that come out in this tool. So we know that this is a very simple approach to what can be a very complex situation at a utility. But just to get a conversation guard started and to incorporate it potentially as a strategy, this is one way that you can look at it. 
The third strategy is to optimize the repair time. So this is looking at those leaks that are reported and surface. So as they become known, how quickly can you get to them? Can you fix them within the day? Or are you in the news, like this example that I pulled just this morning, where it's multiple days um, that impact folks? So what you're gonna wanna incorporate, oops, um, here is basically the, um, it as a percentage of the reported leak duration. So if typically you get to it within four days and now you might get to it in three days, you can incorporate that as a percentage reduction in how long that leak lasts. And then what would the cost to do that? So this is staff um, and probably equipment. So note that this does not include staff and equipment for the proactive leak surveying and detection crews for that proactive work. So these should be considered separate costs. So try not to double dip here. And then the outputs that are in this uh, module, um, one is this graph that shows the different components um, that total your total real losses over time. So it's shown here sort of as a, um, a layer cake, but then um, really what it translates here to is that sum is translated into this blue bar on the right-hand side that shows what real water losses are would be projected um, without any proactive management. And then the orange line shows the potential impact of the management strategies that you've incorporated in terms of how they might affect real water losses over the timeline that you've set for the tracking tool overall. So in this case, we picked 2020 as a base year, and so it's gonna look at 2021 moving forward um, to 2040 in this case. And you'll see um, the rate of rise here is the yellow slice. Um, and this is where that sensitivity um, comes in of how much this plays out here. Um, and then the ICF factor, the other one that is particularly sensitive to the results will affect this lighter blue um, base of the cake down here. The other output is these economic estimates. So if you have incorporated the avoided costs, um, this will automatically calculate no matter what, um, but if you've incorporated the um, information on the avoided cost tab, you will um, get meaningful results out of this. Otherwise, this will just incorporate the costs associated with the water loss management strategies. And so this will look pretty terrible because it will show um, just costs and no benefits. And therefore, you'll probably get a pretty terrible net present value. So basically, you can try to figure out, you can test out different strategies and different levels of the programs and see what you could potentially justify from a cost benefit analysis perspective. Um, so really it's um, the net present value is a way of consolidating the fact that costs and benefits occur at different times, especially over this planning horizon. And so there are, um, it's the concept that future impacts, both good and bad in terms of the benefits and the costs um, are basically reduced in value or discounted since they are less significant than those same costs and benefits today. So if you have a higher so-called discount rate, that means that future effects are increasingly less significant, whereas a lower discount rate might mean that those are more equally significant. So um, there's some tips on this in the guidebook, but basically earlier on in the tracking tool, there's a way, uh, a place to put a discount rate as well as an inflation rate. And I'd suggest just connecting with your financial office um, they typically have a number that they use for their financial planning. It might be the cost of borrowing money, so the cost of funds, um, and your finance office will typically have some sort of expectation for long-term inflation, and those are all incorporated in tab one of the overall tracking tool. So you don't have to necessarily incorporate the information here and use this, but if you do want to, you need to incorporate the information on the avoided cost tab. Um, and then it will incorporate the costs associated with the different management strategies that you have entered and generate a benefit cost ratio. And this you could also use to compare with the other water conservation strategies that you might have inputted into the tracking tool overall. Because if you're doing it for um, these, you can also get it for your um, other strategies and look at the benefit cost ratio of water loss management in conjunction with water conservation and efficiency strategies too.
So I'm going to bring over the tool. Let me bring it up. Brad, I'll pause real quick. Can you see the tool all right? Yes, I can. Great, thank you. So this is what the conservation tracking tool looks like overall. You'll see the tabs across the bottom. This is the little start. Um, and then tab one is the service area data. This is where you'll enter in what I just talked about, this discount rate and inflation rate, and incorporate what you want your base year as well as your um, planning horizon here. Um, the water loss module is tab seven over here. And this is where you'll see the distribution system inputs as well as the real water loss inputs and estimates. And then the three different strategies are down here, the leak detection and repair, pressure reduction, and accelerated reported leak repair. And then you'll see that you have the two visuals here, which is the um, projecting out real losses over time without proactive management. And then that cake translates into this blue line here, which is again the real losses projected over time uh, without proactive management. And then the orange incorporates an estimate of what it would look like with proactive management. And in this example that you see here, you can see that we've selected options for leak detection and repair and pressure reduction. In this case, we don't have accelerated leak repair. But if we were to, let's say, enter something in here, let's say we're going to get to it 25% faster, um, that would then help get incorporated in here. Or you can see if um, the survey rate, you do 12 miles a month. Let's see if this will translate. If you do 30 miles a month, um, it takes a little bit to incorporate. Um, and then it translates into different ones here. I'll point out just here the different sensitivities. Um, so if infrastructure condition factor, if you say put in three instead, um, you can see how this actually messes with it too much here. Um, the, the math isn't adding up for this tool. So that really doesn't make sense for the other parameters that we've affected here, but maybe I'll make a slightly less one. So if I go back to the 1.2 factor, and instead say 1.5. You can see how the background losses jumped up. So I'll go back to 1.2. And then the hidden losses, of course, goes down because that's a simple calculation of what's left over. So that's basically taking from the hidden losses in this particular case. Rate of rise, we have it as 1.75 or 0.75. What if I made it 1.5? And you'll see that this slope goes up faster. And so the rate of rise leaks grow faster over time. Um, and let's say we don't do any pressure reduction. Actually, let me go back to the original one here. So we're working from the same presumptions. So if I come down here and I say I don't do any pressure reduction, reason this isn't uh, sometimes it can take a little bit to readjust these graphs and my computer is breaking out a little bit so apologies there but these are the different scenarios that you can play out with and you'll see down here it can generate different estimates down here so right now we only have costs associated with this leak detection and repair and so that's what's um, being incorporated here. So this is pretending like it costs nothing to respond to leaks faster. So let's maybe incorporate um, what it would take to bring that in. I don't know. Then it would incorporate some additional um, benefits and costs here. So these are all different things that you can play out with and apologies that this isn't generating on the fly here. Um, I think maybe my computer is a little mad that I'm trying to do a webinar and play with a spreadsheet at the same time. Um, but these are different things that you can play around with the different estimates and then where it translates over to is click over three or tabs. Um, oops, I went too far. 
you'll find it in here, this first green tab, which is an output tab, demand projections. And this is that yellow line, which incorporates proactive water loss management strategies. And it also generates some nice graphics which show um, information about uh, non-revenue water projections um, and how things impact your baseline demand projection. And then you can, of course, adjust those forecasts if you have better information that you want to incorporate, maybe on a different year-by-year -year basis. And down here, you can turn on and off whether or not you're incorporating real losses and proactive water loss management into um, this. So you'll see the yellow line went up. It's much closer to the other lines, and it is taking out that real water loss management strategy, whereas you can click it back on and say, yes, we're going to do that. And scroll back up, and you'll see that that has dropped significantly because of the parameters that we have in place. I will jump back here just to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions, and I will wrap up um, a few other nuggets. Um, for a separate project that we were working on this year um, related to um, advanced metering infrastructure and link notifications, we asked folks, um, and we had 102 complete survey responses from utilities, we asked how many actually complete a comprehensive system water loss audit, which might be similar, uh, might be done using that free water loss software that AWWA, AWWA provides. And 77% said yes, um, a chunk of our respondents weren't sure, and only a small portion, 10% said no. Um, and the great nugget that I saw too, the next step that we asked was around how many um, conservation or efficiency personnel are involved in that water loss audit process. So some, sometimes that process is owned by the meter shop or the distribution folks. Um, and sometimes the water efficiency um, people aren't brought into it. Um, in this case, we had 65% who said yes. So if you look 60 of this, I should have done the, the next step here, but so 77% yes and 65% said um, this is of the total that have one. So most of the people who have an audit have their conservation or efficiency personnel involved, which is great to hear. Um, that full leak notification report will be coming soon, um, but this I just wanted to bring in this additional data point that we had that was relevant for today. The other nugget that's relevant for today is that we have our state scorecard coming out soon. soon. So our five-year update of the um, state scorecard, so it'll be the 2022 state policy scorecard for water efficiency and sustainability. And this provides a one through 50 rank and a letter grade for each state based on um, responses to, in this case, a 23 question survey. And it's really just looking at state level laws and policies. So it's not getting into utility specifics or local laws or ordinances or regulations that are in place. But what we saw was that 28 states have statutes or regulations that in some way put a limit on water loss and distribution systems. And of those, 24 states require utilities to submit water loss audit information. Some of that is made public. So for example, in California um, and a couple other states, you can go and find their water loss reports um, online and dig into those. So if you don't currently do it at your organization, you could go to the California's uh, website and look at what a water loss um, audit looks like. And there are states that either um, have or are going to be offering training or technical assistance on water loss, how to do the audits, how to work together in your organization, what strategies to look at to manage either data quality issues or the actual management strategies you might want to incorporate. And so here are some examples of states that fall into that bucket. And some of them actually have their, you know, training webinars that are posted online. So if you want to learn more and really dig into this, there are some additional resources for you out there. Finally, of course, Alliance for Water Efficiency has additional resources on water loss. I've included the website here. We have a template. So if your utility or municipality wants to adopt a policy around addressing water loss management and a goal that you want to set for yourself, then here's an example of um, a policy and ordinance that you could adopt, um, of course, customizable. And then after the last round of the state scorecard in 2017, um, AW created a state level specific focus on water loss report. And so um, that's the screenshot that you see here. And then there's an interactive map that you can click on each map and see specifics for each state of what they um, required or incorporated at the time. 
And largely what we've seen is things haven't changed a whole lot since 2017, 2018, 2019 timeframe um, for probably a variety of reasons, but hopefully more and more focus will be on water loss. And the great thing about um, addressing it at the state level is that it sort of creates um, the bar for what all utilities need to address. And I will point out that other organizations like of course AWWA, which we pointed out um, previously, as well as the Water Research Foundation has additional resources on water loss. Um, so if you're looking for more, or if your working group that works on water loss audits wants to dig in more, these are additional places that you can find great resources. Um, and I will point out because I am reporting live from Colorado that next year the North American Water Loss Conference is gonna be in Denver, Colorado in December. So if you wanna keep tabs on that, there's the website there for that event. And then before we switch to questions, I will just put a quick plug for our next webinar. So our next Values for Water Efficiency webinar is focused on cooling technology. We have um, a final complete set of resources and tools looking at providing education and information about cooling technology and cooling towers, as well as alternative to cooling towers technology. Um, so we'll be sharing all of those resources and tools, like a how-to guide, um, an audit tool, and an ROI calculator. Plus, we're going to previewing our first ever learning cohort opportunity um, where utilities can come together and work with other professionals on either starting or advancing their cooling tower programs. So that's November 15th, um, and you can register at our webinar link below. So I will stop there and say thank you, and I will turn it to Brad to see what questions we either have in the chat or um, anything that's come up. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, as you know, you could always put questions in the chat. If you still have questions, I still have the uh, question and chat open, so feel free to keep submitting now, but we'll just go in order when we get them. So Lisa, the first question for you is a two-parter. Um, how is the ICF calculated, and can this tool be used on individual pressure zones? submitted by Aaron Graham. Aaron, if I misinterpreted your question, please uh, send me a chat. So the ICF factor is a user, um, the user enters that. So that is basically up to your organization to determine a level for that. I think there are some resources out there about maybe kind of a rule of thumb of what you could use if you don't know. Um, but largely it's a way to kind of put, it's a, it's a way to scale things, but it um, it's a place where I think more information and research is needed based on when I've talked to other folks about this tool, but it's a way just to get at kind of your overall condition factor. So if your organization has been really delinquent in updating your um, infrastructure and keeping on top of um, your um, main repairs and replacement, then you're going to have a worse infrastructure um, condition factor than others. So it's um, it's a kind of a high level way to incorporate the fact that um, the overall state of your distribution system will contribute to water losses. And Brad, what was the second part of the question? Can this tool be used on individual pressure zones? Mm, yes, great question. So I think you could probably play around with that if you wanted to, um, right now it looks at sort of the whole distribution system, but if you wanted to within the module, you could adapt and just enter the number of miles that are within a given pressure system. So you could just basically treat the tracking tool and do on a um, pressure zone by pressure zone basis. So you could pretend that each pressure zone was its own sort of service area and come up with the number of service connections and the miles of main um, distribution lines that are incorporated in that area. So if you have that information, you could look at it by pressure zone by pressure zone. You just then have to re-enter the information by pressure zone. So you could save different versions of the tracking tool, one for pressure zone one, one for pressure zone two, and you could play with it that way. So that would be um, off the top of my head, that would be my recommendation if you really wanted to dig into different pressure zones. All right, great. Thanks, Liesl. So the next question is, what underlying equations are used to calculate water savings with pressure reduction? So the, um, let me bring this back up. So in the tracking tool, um, we really want to make sure that the information 
um, that this is relatively easy to use, but we want the information, the background information to be available. So if you scroll all the way to the right, you'll find all these gray tabs and um, you'll find the water loss model. And this is where all of the different information is getting calculated and generated back here. So it brings in the information from the sort of more user-friendly tab, but it all generates over here. And this is what contributes to the different um, graphs and into the demand projections. So if you wanted to see how all of the calculations are being incorporated and how they translate, this would be the tab to go into and dig into for um, any of them, um, the different things that go in. So you can see even how the different um, costs translate into the cost benefit analysis. Uh, we really wanted to make sure that this was um, transparent so that if you have a different way you're approaching it in your organization, you can modify the forecast um, or you can basically just see how it's translated here and see if that's going to um, work for you or if you can adapt as needed. So that is all available and transparent for you. You just have to click really far to the right to find these gray tabs and the one that's called the water loss model. All right. Thanks again, Lisa. Next question I have, um, this was more in the moment, I believe, but it was how does the ICF affect the blue wedge? Erin, uh, I know you asked this one again, so um, if you have any clarification on that, I'm assuming the blue wedge is part of one of the graphics. Yeah, let's see, the blue, let's, I'm gonna, apologies, I'm gonna click all the way back here. Um, um, so the ICF here, is again where you input in um, one and the outputs here are these. And let me see if the tool will be cooperative today and we can show how it works. Uh, there you are, water loss management. So the ICF, we'll put in a, like a 1.6 instead of our 1.2. Um, and this really just affects background losses. So the way it translates is really in terms of contributing to what the background losses look like and what percentage that contributes to here. Whereas if I go back down to 1.2, you can see that the other numbers and these other touch points did not, were not affected. It's really just affecting background losses in this particular model. Any other questions, Brad? Okay, um, the next question I'm seeing um, is, what equation is used to calculate the background losses? So the background losses, this one is really just looking at, um, it's scaling based on some of the distribution system information. So if we go over here to our water loss module, and your background losses. So this is pulling in background losses from um, the original tab. So maybe we have to go back over here to see what the calculation looks like. Just so you can see it live. So background loss and that calculation is doing it for me here. Um, I don't want to misinterpret this. Oh, this is right here, yeah. So this incorporates, yes, the distribution system factor. So it incorporates an equation that looks at the miles of mains and um, comes up with sort of that um, leaks per miles per day, as well as incorporates what the pressure was. Um, and so there's an equation here that you can see the whole thing. We wanted to make all of this really transparent so you can see um, it basically brings in information from your uh, distribution system inputs. Um, and so I won't read it all here for you, but this is the equation that contributes to the estimate of the background losses based on the distribution system inputs that you generated. All right, and uh, the last question I have written here is that the, w, the WRF Water Research Foundation have great resources, but not all are available to non-members and membership can be very expensive. Does AW have access to these resources? So that's a great question. Um, yes, there are some resources that are available to the public and some that aren't. Um, 
WRF has a system where um, some of the resources are available. You just have to sort of sign up. I think they call it like a public plus. So you just have to make a login and be able to have access to some of those resources. Um, so those are subscriber resources. So while AWE um, would be able to access those, we wouldn't want, we wouldn't be able to then distribute them to non-subscribers of WRF. However, if you had some technical assistance questions that we could maybe dig into our access to resources and provide you with some answers, um, that might be um, relevant as part of a technical assistance support. But in terms of just taking those resources from WRF and, and distributing to, to non-subscribers, we wouldn't do that. All right, thanks again, Liesl. That was the last question I see in the question box and chat right now. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, you can submit it. I see we're about out of time, but we can address those in an email to you and send it out later. But if uh, that's it, then that would be our final question. Great, thank you, Brad. And thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. And this is again recorded. So for folks that couldn't join us today, or if you wanna look back over time um, or generates additional questions, don't hesitate to reach out and hopefully we'll see you on a future webinar. And thank you for joining us.